Hey kids, Brother Matt, and welcome back to CBC Kids Online. I am so glad that you're here, but I am extra glad that this Sunday, we're gonna be able to start having services again here in the building. Now it's gonna be a little slow at first. We're gonna be putting people in different rooms and we are not going to have junior church or Sunday school yet, but we're making a step in the right direction. So we're gonna keep doing videos uh, on here for the children's lessons, uh, but in a couple of weeks, hopefully, we're gonna start uh, putting junior church back in the schedule, adding the bus route back to schedule. We're gonna try to get back to normal as soon as possible. But until then, keep watching these. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Grab your Bibles. We're going to keep practicing to get faster than Marley Gibson at sword drills. So grab your Bible by the spine, pages on top. We're going to John chapter 4. We've been in the book of John quite a bit lately. John chapter 4. Are you ready? Three, two, one, and go. Let me tell you a quick story while you're finding yourself there. I don't know if you've seen one of these before. Some of you have probably sold a couple of boxes of these or you have some boxes at home. When I was your age, I was basically a professional at selling chocolate bars. Now, unlike probably your family, I don't think anyone at Central does this, but our family, when I was growing up, sold boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes. In fact, our garages uh, every summer were, were full of these boxes. We had a semi-truck come to our house and unload them just in our driveway because we didn't just sell chocolate bars to go to church camp. We sold chocolate bars to afford homeschool, which it was crazy, but you know, hey, my parents, good for them. They got us to do it. So we were selling tons. So when I would go to people, uh, specifically, I, I would like to go to barbers. Those always sold really, really well when I was over there. Um, pawn shops, those were great. Surprisingly, dentist offices, they love chocolate. And so whenever I would go to these places, I would bring my box in. I had a couple of tricks, but I won't get into that. Um, and, and I would say, uh, hello, would you help me go to church camp by buying the world's finest chocolate bar for a dollar? I forgot the exact spill, but sometimes I'd be like, oh, will you help me go to school by buying a, a, box, a, a, a bar of chocolate or a couple for a dollar? Or, or, or I remember one time we even sold chocolate bars so we could go on vacation. And so I would go to the dentist office or the pawn shop or the, or the uh, uh, doctor's offices. You know, uh, banks weren't really, really good because they didn't have a lot of cash that they could spend, you know. But I would go to all these places and I would just be like, oh, help me go on vacation or school or church camp. There was one place, though, that if we ever came across one, we knew we would sell a lot at. But they were my least favorite places to go. Car dealerships. Now, just a tip. If you are selling chocolate bars, car dealerships are amazing for a couple of reasons. The first person you'll talk to is a salesperson like you. They're trying to sell cars. So they feel bad for you already. They're also trying to make a lasting impression on your parents by helping you out. And so they are really, really good. But you don't just deal with the car salesman. You deal with the receptionists and the, and the contract people. And if you're extra fortunate, you can get a really nice salesperson who's trying to, you know, butter you up and, and, and make you uh, feel like you're going you're gonna, to you sell lots of chocolate bars. They would take you to the back where the garage is. And the garage is where you had all of these tall, strong men who were mechanics. And they weren't like the salespeople. The salespeople were dressed up and, 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 and kind, of like, kind of like what I'm wearing, khakis and a button-up shirt, shirt. And they were always like, you know, just all happy all the time. But when we got to the back, there were guys bald heads and big beards, and, and, and they were tall, and, they, and some of them were strong, some of them were, were big and fat, and, and, and they, were, they, they, they were very intimidating. When I would go back there, because, you know, you have all these cars around, and they're, they're all high up in the sky being worked on on their little, their kits, or I don't know, and so they're all up there, and they've got all their big, loud tools, and and they're working on changing tires and fixing brakes and doing other car mechanic stuff. And they're doing all these things. And, and the salespeople would, would bring us along. 
But this time, I'd be so scared because these guys were so scary looking. And I, and I would go up to them with my box of chocolate and be like, oh, can, I, can you please buy a chocolate bar? I hated it. You know why? Because talking to these mechanics made me uncomfortable. Now, thankfully, the, those mechanics were always very nice, very hungry, and had tons of cash. And so they would buy boxes and boxes of chocolate. But how, how many of you have ever felt that way, where it has been hard for you to start a conversation? Some of you, that, that's no problem. Like I'm thinking right now of Jaden Loney. Jaden Loney has never met a stranger in his life. He'll talk to anybody. <laughs> but maybe even Jaden Loney, Jaden Jaden Loney, Jaden Loney has been in a place where maybe you were a little intimidated by with talking with some people you didn't know, or were scared by the type of person that you were around. You know that feeling where you just feel small, embarrassed, and ashamed? Maybe like your first day at school or your first time playing a new sport with, with teammates that you don't know yet? You know that, that feeling or the first time you meet uh, the kids on your neighborhood? It can be a, a little uh, scary. In, in fact, can you imagine how scary it feels, or maybe you've experienced this before, where you wanted, your parents told you, hey, invite Susan on your block, your neighbor, or the person you go to school with, or your teammate, or Billy, or whatever, and say, you know, invite them to junior church, or invite them to vacation Bible school. Ask them about if they go to church anywhere. That can be scary, right? That can be embarrassing. Or maybe some of you have even been convicted in your heart because you're a Christian and you're saved and you know that the person, maybe the, the cousin or the person, your friend at school or in karate class or music class, you, you know they are not saved and you've been worried in your heart because you are scared to talk to them. Ever felt that way before? Because I'll tell you what, it is a little bit intimidating talking to other people about God, especially friends or even worse, people that are not already your friends. There's a passage in the Bible where Jesus leads by example and uses uh, his experience talking to another person about, about the kingdom of God, about the gospel, about, about who he was, and how he used it to teach his disciples, his followers, a lesson. Let me, let me explain to you uh, what happens. In John chapter 4, Jesus, again, he's just starting his ministry. He's talked to a few people. He's done a few really low-key miracles. And, and he's at a place where, where he was at. Uh, there, there were a bunch of cities. And, and where he was at, at, at John chapter 4, was a place called uh, Judea. And above that, way north, is where he needed to go. In fact, I think it says that in verse 2 of chapter 4, uh, he needs to go to Galilee. If you were to, probably in your Bible, if you can, go to the back and see if there's a map where it says Jesus' ministry and see if you can find Judea uh, on the bottom part of, of the little, little tick of country and at the top part, a place called Samaria. These, not, not Samaria, uh, Galilee. These, these are different provinces. And so you can see those two. But in, I think it says, verse 3, let's go ahead and look to make sure. Oh, okay, verse 3, it says this. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. So Jesus is starting on the lower part of the state or country, however you want to think of it in your own mind, uh, Judea. And then he wants to go all the way up to Galilee. But look at verse 4. It says this. And he must needs go through Samaria. In, in, the, in that map in, the, in your Bible, you'll probably see Judea on the bottom, uh, Galilee, Galilee, <laughs> Galilee on the top, and in the middle, right there in the middle, is a place called Sam, Sam, Samaria. Samar <laughs> I forgot. 
Samaria. Yeah, of course. Samaritan, Samaria. I, 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 I had a little dumb moment. Samaria, okay? Y'all enjoy this at home. So, Judea, I have a, it's been a long day, guys. Stop. Okay, Judea, and then Galilee. And then in the middle was a place called Samaria. Now, these people that lived in this place were called Samaritans. And we're not going to go into why. Basically, if you were a Jew living in one of those places, Judea or Galilee, the people in Samaria called the Samaritans, you did not like them for a bunch of reasons. Uh, bad things happened in the Old Testament. Samaritans uh, were sometimes against the other Jews on some of the political stuff that happened. But also there was some long history and long like rivalries to where the, the Jews in Judea and Galilee, they didn't talk to the people in the middle. The, those people were unpopular. In fact, it was so bad that when someone wanted to go from Judea all the way to Galilee, they didn't want to go in the middle part. And sometimes, uh, specifically uh, the people in the northern place, Judea, what they would do is they would go all the way around. To go in, going straight up would, just, would take like a, a small trip walking, like three days. But to go around, it took a long time. But they did that because they didn't want to spend any time near these Samaritans. They, they wanted nothing to do with them. But notice what Jesus says. He must needs go through Samaria. And, and the reason why, because Jesus knows everything. He knows What's about to happen, what's already happened, he even knows the hearts of men. And Jesus knew that in Samaria, there was somebody who, knew, who needed to hear about the kingdom of God, about the gospel. So basically, to kind of explain what happens, uh, Jesus walking through Samaria gets to a place called uh, Sakar. Now, when he gets to this place, he is tired because he, he's, he's walked for a while. And, and his followers decide they're going to go and buy some food. And, and Jesus ends up sitting down at a well. And the well was actually pretty, can, can, uh, uh, a pre, like a pretty famous well because it had to do with uh, Jacob, one of the patriarchs of all of Israel. It was a pretty big deal. And Jesus is sitting there. But let me see if I can read this to you. Verse uh, 6. Let's go to verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now verse 7. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. A couple things. Remember, the, the people that lived in Judea and Galilee, they did not like Samaritans. But back then, a Samaritan woman... It, it, back then, it wasn't like, like today where, you know, women are respected. Women have, you know, rights. Back then, if you were a woman, you, could, you weren't uh, encouraged to talk to the men. It, it, was, it was like a, it was a hierarchy to where that they were low on the totem pole. And in fact, if you were a, a, a Jewish man from, from Galilee or Judea, you were not supposed to talk to Samaritans, but especially not Samaritan woman. And what does Jesus say to her? Sitting on this well, this woman comes, coming to draw water for herself. He says, give me to drink. Now, this well, this specific well, was like, was like a, a hole in the ground that was connected to a spring. And, and, it, and it said that this, this specific well was about a hundred 50 feet deep. And so what they would have, they would have a Buzz Lightyear bucket, the bucket I had from, remember from VBS, we put the pennies in there? Yeah. So they would have this uh, bucket, probably not a bucket like this, but let's just imagine a bucket. And then what they would do is they get a big rope and tie the rope. I'm not going to tie it because I don't know really how to tie stuff. And then they would put it down the hole and lower it, and lower it, and lower it. And then after it got full of water, you know what they would do? They would start pulling it all the way up. And it was so heavy because it was so far down. And it carry, and carry, all the way until they got the bucket full of water. But Jesus is saying, 
okay, do that, but also do it for me. Well, Samaritan woman's like, say what? You want me to go get you a bucket of water? But do you know what she says? Look at at verse 6. I'm sorry, verse 9. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. This woman knew. A, A person like Jesus was not socially allowed to talk to a woman like her, who was from Samaria, who was a Samaritan. And she knew that. But you know what Jesus says? Listen, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is thou that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. I'll kind of just explain what happens next. Jesus takes this opportunity of where he is at this well to teach this woman and explain to this woman who he was and what he had to offer as the Savior and Son of God. And if you go to this verse, you can read it on your own. There begins a conversation, and they talk about lots of, th- lots of different things. They, they talk, the Samaritan woman asked, like, well, well, why do you think you should get this water from me? And they talk a little bit about the well and what it represented. And then eventually Jesus starts talking about, well, I actually have to offer a different type of water, a type of water that when you drink of, you'll never thirst again. And starts to explain slowly and reveal that he had something to offer that would eternally satisfy And they begin to discuss, and the Samaritan woman begins to be intrigued. And they begin to have a conversation. Eventually, it gets to the point where Jesus asks asks the Samaritan woman, go ahead and and get your your husband. And so we can talk about this. And the the Samaritan woman says, oh, I have no husband. But Jesus, knowing everything, knew that this woman had been married before and was even right now living with someone who was not her husband. She was actually living in sin. And, and he actually says that to the Samaritan woman. And the Samaritan woman realizes that this, this person was special and had powers. And she says, oh, sir, you must be a prophet. And then what she decides to do, try to distract Jesus by ta- changing the subject and starts to get into like a, like a religious argument about the relationship between uh, the, the Jews in, in Galilee and Judea and the Samaritans, and starts to do that. But, but you know what Jesus does? He starts to answer her questions and re-navigate the conversation from what she was trying to change the subject to back to her need for a Savior. You, you know what Jesus did? He took the opportunity that was around him, the, the well, the circumstances, her need for a Savior. He, she took all that and used the opportunity to talk to somebody about the gospel. Later, it turns out that the disciples come and see this discussion taking place, and they are shocked. The Bible actually says, marveled that Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman, this very unpopular person. They don't say anything. And they they, they come to him and say, hey, you you need to eat this food. But Jesus says, "Uh, this is not what I'm here for. Look at what he says. I'll I'll read it to you now. He says this when talking about his purpose. In verse 34, he says this. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. What he was explaining there is that there was an opportunity where he was at to reach souls. And because he loved God and cared for the people around him, he was going to take advantage of the opportunity to explain the gospel to the lost. It wasn't a time just to relax and eat food and take advantage of the nice day. No, he knew that today was a day to explain the gospel to others. And that was his priority. You know, 
Jesus was not offended by this woman. He, he wasn't trying to stay away so that it wouldn't look like he was talking to someone who was unpopular. He loved that woman just like he loved the disciples and just like he loves you. And Jesus cared about this woman. And so it didn't matter that it was, you know, socially awkward or a little bit scary or inconvenient. No, he decided to take advantage of the opportunity to explain the gospel because he cared for that person. And you know what? If, if you are saved, we've talked a lot about being saved the past couple of weeks. If you are not saved, you're not sure you're going to heaven, make sure you talk to someone you can trust who goes to this church and, and, and make sure you get that settled. But let me imagine that who I'm talking to today are Christians. That means you've asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins. You've made him your savior. Now, if you're that person, It may be really scary to try to explain the gospel or talk to others about God, especially, especially with people you don't know very well, or even the people in your school or or class or, 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 you know, neighborhood that are not very popular. But here's the deal. If you care about those friends, those cousins, those people in your school, your neighbors, if you care about them, you should be looking for opportunities to tell them about God. Because the truth is is that every single one of us will be held accountable uh, to our sin and if we are saved one day when we die. And the truth is, is there's some people on your baseball team, on your soccer team, in in your gym class, in your neighborhood, in your family who need to be saved. And if you are saved and you know how the gospel works, if you care about those people that you live next to or the people that you see on the team or the people that you know that are your cousins or or, or whatever, if you care about them, it is really important that you take any opportunity, any chance you get to make sure that they know that they can be saved through the power and the love of God. Now, think about it. When Jesus did this, he did two things. I I would say he did more things probably, but let's think of two things. Jesus, in the conversation that he had, he was was persistent. When when the Samaritan woman was talking to him, she often tried to uh, give a little jab at him. Like, ah, you shouldn't be asking for water. You're a Jewish person. No, because of you, what right do you think you have to this well? And all these kind of things. But Jesus did not give up. He continued to have the conversation, even when she tried to divert the attention and change the subject. I would also say this. Jesus was persistent, but he was also patient. Even though this woman was trying to get out of talking about it, and even though she, he, she was trying to change the subject and to make excuses, he loved her. He didn't get upset. He didn't get angry. He, he answered her questions. He was very careful. He was in no rush. And we normally have two action steps, so let's do that. When it comes to you talking to people in your school or friends or neighborhood, remember these two things when talking to others about Jesus. Number one, be persistent. This doesn't mean be obnoxious. This means don't give up. Because most likely, when you first ask, first ask them to go to church, they might blow you off. They might not care what you have to say. They might try to make excuses, but, but we see from Jesus that when you're talking to others about the gospel, don't give up. Be persistent. Don't, don't, don't be annoying, but be willing to keep asking because their eternity depends on it. And then the second action step, be patient. This is very important because when you're explaining to people uh, the gospel and they have no previous experience of them understanding how God works and how God loves them, they're going to have questions. And and they're going to uh, maybe not say, yes, I want to get saved right away. It's important that, that we are persistent. We don't give up, but we're also patient. That means we are going to have to listen. We're going to have to answer questions or get them answers. And we're going to have to realize that this may take a while. They might not get saved right away. But if we care about 
these people in our lives. If we truly love them, we're going to have to decide to take all the opportunities we can to get them to know Christ, to explain to them the gospel, to tell them about God. Now, I know I'm saying this right now at a time where you can't go home. This is why it's important for us right now to decide when we get the chance to get out of our houses, start playing with the friends in our neighborhood again, start going back to our sports practices, start getting back to normal, will you be ready to not be ashamed? Will, will you maybe even memorize a few verses about what it, needs to be, what it means to be saved? Would you start praying that God will give you the strength that when things get back to normal, you would be courageous enough to ask people in your life to come to church to be saved? Would you be willing to pray for strength and courage to do that so that when you have the opportunity again, that you would tell others about God? There's a verse that helps us remember the importance of telling others about the gospel. And it's in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. You can go there if you want. We're just going to memorize the first part of this verse. So that's all. We're not splitting it up. So uh, five-year-old or younger, all the way up to sixth grade, we're just going to try together to memorize this verse. Romans 1, 16. It goes like this. For I, or you can point at your I, for I am not ashamed. I think we may have done this like for hide or something, but ashamed means like you don't want to talk to somebody, right? So for I am not, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is found in the word of God. So imagine that for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's very important for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? This is the next part of the verse. For it is the power. Flex your muscles. I don't really got much, but you flex whatever you got. You're probably way stronger than me. For, I, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, when we do salvation, this is actually the sign language for, for, uh, for salvation. Salvation. Pretend like you are in, in bonds and chains like a prisoner and then be set free. That's what salvation is, to be set free from sin. So for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, there's more to the verse. I know that last week some of you did the rest of the verse. If you can do that, go for it. That would be very impressive. But as long as you're doing that, uh, the, the rest of that verse, we're going to get the prize for you this week. So last week, I, I, I learned something. I got really small baskets, but I got really big sunglasses. So I learned my lesson this week. For the prize this week, I got something very small. I know a lot of you. In fact, uh, today, I, I saw, saw your Gibson, and he, and he was like, and I, I heard that he really would like some more Bubba Teeth. He's really into that. So because of that, you know what we're going to do? We're going to give all of you Bubba Teeth. And it's going to be so exciting. You're going to be so fancy. You can, you can take them back to church and, and, and talk like this forever. It, it just makes you look really good on the face. So if you want Bubba Teeth, this, this pair is actually going to go uh, to, let's see, who would really like this? I think Michelle would really like this. I'm going, to get, I'm going to put this in your basket. The rest of you will get clean ones, but I know Michelle would really. I'm just kidding. In fact, if you are a girl and, and you are like, ah, Brother Matt, I don't like rubber teeth. Don't worry. I've got, a, I've got a couple of these snap-on bracelets, which a lot of you think are really cool. If you want a slap bracelet instead of rubber teeth in the video, just say that. It's like, I want a snap bracelet, not rubber teeth, please. By the way... Last week, for the verses, some of you adults did some really creative things when you did the verse. I'm so proud of you, proud of you for doing that. Uh, I, I saw Sawyer, he did it with big sunglasses and a yo-yo, doing the whole verse like that. And then I also saw really, really cool Wesson and Maverick do their verse, but they did it in the dark because it was like, for I am the light, you know? So what they would do, they started in the dark, and when it said light, the light turned on. And it was Really, really cool. I thought that was really, really creative. So good job, guys. Let's practice this verse one more time, though. So it goes Roman 1.16. Sometimes you can say A if you want, because that tells you it's not the whole verse, it's just the first part. Go ahead and do that with me if you can. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. I'm sorry, not a gospel of Jesus Christ. 
gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Very, very good. I am so proud of you. I am excited to see those of you that can make it to services Sunday. But for the rest of you, I will see you next week. So I'm going to go home. Uh, I don't know what I'm eating for dinner. I've actually started learning how to cook this uh, while we're in quarantine, and I love it. So maybe I'll make something. I don't know. I'll let you know. But I want to go home. I'm going to go eat, take a nap because I got a big headache. The rest of you, I will see you either Sunday or next week. Bye.